Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's Next in Kubernetes. I'm Bob Killen, a program manager within Google's Open Source Programs Office, also a longtime contributor to the Open Source Kubernetes Project. And I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the overarching future paths for Kubernetes. But before I can dig into what's next, I need to talk a little bit about where we've been what it's taken for Kubernetes to become the foundational platform that powers so much today. From a high level, you can sort of break down Kubernetes phases into three broad layers that highlight a focus or theme in the project's life cycle. The first and the longest was four years from June 2014 to March 2018. This is a period of rapid growth where all the various resource types are being defined and solidified. These are the base components that are used by everything else. Think of the core workloads, such as deployments, stateful sets, and all the others. These core workloads graduated to GA in the 1.9 release and was shortly thereafter recognized by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's Technical Oversight Committee approving the project for graduation. Kubernetes was the first project to achieve the status. It was recognized for being stable, used by a number of companies, having a diverse contributor base and solid project governance. This is the foundational stage and every future thing is built on top of it. The second phase from March, 2018, to September 2019 is marked by the graduation of Custom Resource Definitions, or CRDs, a unified pattern to extend Kubernetes. It created an entire ecosystem allowing people, projects, and organizations to create and manage their own applications in any other sort of Kubernetes resource. Instead of managing these deployments, you can now directly manage things like a database or a game server in a Kubernetes native way. It was huge for the cloud native landscape. And if you look at the CNCF with its hundred or so projects, you'll find that the majority of them are using CRDs. This last phase from late 2019 to August, 2020, isn't noted by a new feature, but a shift in the mentality of the project. We built our core workload types. We've made the project easy to extend. And now with more users than ever using the project, we shifted to supportability and stability. Policies and processes were put in place to help ensure every feature being developed was observable, scalable, could be rolled back, and a slew of other uh, important things for general operations. And in doing so, we were more comfortable expanding our support window um, with new releases being supported for a full year. We built our core, we made it easy to extend and integrate with, and then committed ourselves to a stronger support policy. So that takes us to now and where we're going. And I'll keep the theme for this one sort of a secret to the end, but I wanna give you an idea of some of the features and areas of where we're focusing. And for that, I picked two big things to follow. The first is multi-cluster. So why multi-cluster? Kubernetes has done a lot to help people rethink and reshape their architecture and build more resilient and scalable systems. But for many use cases, you can't just build a larger cluster. Say you want global availability and to minimize the latency to your customers. That's something you can't easily do with a single cluster. Or you might want to scale and burst your workloads especially in something like a hybrid environment where you've outgrown your on-prem hardware and want to burst to the cloud. You may also be working with privileged or sensitive data and want to maximize your security by using clusters as a security boundary. Or lastly, you may just want to make your application more resilient by running multiple clusters in HA and to segment your failure domains. The list goes on. And it's often one of the first places organizations go to after getting up and going with a single cluster. Now with that, 
I'm going to go out a little on a limb, but in a multi-cluster world, clusters are the new pod. As management of Kubernetes clusters becomes easier, it allows you to focus on the important parts, namely your application. Clusters are becoming a tightly coupled grouping of these app components that you might want to scale and secure independently. So just like a deployment manages the pods and helps scale them up and down and manages their life cycle, you should be able to do that with clusters too. So why has this been so hard? Well, to be frank, multi-cluster configurations in their current form are incredibly complex with a lot of moving parts. If you have a database in cluster A that should be accessible to some component in cluster B, it requires a lot of additional plumbing of services between clusters, often additional load balancers or a mix of them with like a service mesh. It's not fun and by no means easy. Also, to be frank, Kubernetes was honestly not really designed for multi-cluster in mind initially, but this has been long recognized by the upstream community and there have been several initiatives targeting and improving this use case. The first is the introduction of multi-cluster services, a new CRD that standardizes the way in which you can share Kubernetes services across clusters. No more additional provisioning of load balancers, no more hodgepodge custom DNS rules that require manual updating. You define a cluster set or a group of two or more clusters and decide which services in each cluster you want to expose, and a new controller will just take care of the rest. For your applications, all you have to do is point them to a new cluster set service DNS entry instead of you know, the regular cluster.local one that we all are sort of used to. And with that, your traffic will be routed appropriately. Now, this is a very simple model, and it was specifically designed to be that way to address the complexity of cross-cluster networking and service discovery to make it an easy to use as a drop-in replacement for current services. Now, there's a lot that goes on under the hood, but you as a user do not need to manage those aspects of it. So now that we have these multi-cluster services that can help you manage your cross-cluster networking, how about ingress? How do you manage getting traffic into your cluster at a global level? Well, there's something for that too. The Gateway API. Think of it as Ingress version 2.0. It was designed with all the lessons learned from the original Kubernetes Ingress implementation with many of the pain points, such as excessive use of annotations uh, being addressed. And for the purposes of multi-cluster, it can use the exports from the multi-cluster services API as a valid backend, allowing you to manage your ingresses at a global level. Now, for GKE, these two resources have come together to offer a very flexible and powerful system. Within GKE, there are two fundamental different types of clusters. Standard, where you retain full control, and autopilot, where much of the management aspects are abstracted away and managed by Google. Autopilot is a great option for many workloads and comes with advantages like better security and per pod billing. But there are some workloads that you know, don't necessarily lend uh, itself to it well. Namely, you know, large stateful applications or things where you may need to run in a pod in privilege mode. But that's where multi-cluster comes in. What if we can interconnect and deploy apps where they fit best without having to worry about the plumbing? You'd be able to take advantage of the greater security and per pod billing for most resources in autopilot and retain the greater control over just the parts of your stack that need it in a standard cluster while honestly managing them in a, in a dramatically easier way. And that's part of the future we're working towards. So now that we've covered multi-cluster, let's take a look at the next focus area. 
and that's in the area of AI, ML, and batch computing. Now, this is an area that's actually near and dear to my heart. Before I started at Google, I was heavily involved in research computing and exploring Kubernetes for high performance computing needs. And while there have been advances, and what I'll say broadly as research computing on top of Kubernetes, there has generally been a much slower rate of adoption of it versus I'll say more traditional applications. And that's because it's hard for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the Kubernetes scheduler is built for bin packing or trying to cram as much on a single node as possible, which tends to go against most really resource intensive jobs. It also doesn't support the concept of co-scheduling where you block scheduling until there's enough resources available to run your entire job. The other thing is most of these research applications also require a lot of tuning, the application, the underlying system or host OS, and also things like the API server. If you're spinning up you know, hundreds of thousands of tasks, you need everything to be working at peak performance and to be able to handle that sort of scale. Now, there are a few things coming in the pipes to help improve this, but I want to focus on one thing that has been an open request for a very long time and will help reduce the complexity of work queues. Work queues are fairly simple in concept. They're a list of tasks or data intended to be processed by one or more workers. They are by far the most common work pattern seen in AI, ML, and batch. You're providing a data set and iterating over it in, a par in parallel for training or processing. And Kubernetes has not really supported this workflow natively. It's always required some other external system, such as PubSub, to keep track of what's being processed. This also means that you must bake in more sort of like middleware logic into your job just to be able to process it. You know, it works. Organizations have been using this pattern since jobs were a thing in Kubernetes. But do you really want to do that? Or would you rather rely on something that can be done nat natively? I'd pick the latter. So in Kubernetes 1.21, a new alpha feature was added to jobs, a completion mode, where if you specify it as indexed, each pod is given a numbered identifier with the index starting at zero. This index will be used in the generation of the pod's host names, giving it something predictable akin to stateful sets. That index is also passed into the pod as an environment variable. And what this does is it gives you the ability, um, a built-in native way to statically assign data to the the process, processes of each pod. It will require a little bit of planning ahead of time, but you won't have to run an external system. You won't have to bake something into your code for the job just to pull items from the queue. It reduces the overall complexity of work queues significantly. And you know, this seems like a small thing, but it solves a problem for a lot of people. In addition to this, there are also several other things in the works that will enable for AI, ML, and batch types of workloads. Things like the scheduler framework, where instead of trying to make the Kubernetes scheduler be everything to everyone, many more hooks and methods of integrating with it have been created. It's now significantly easier to extend and customize how scheduling is done by assigning workloads to different scheduling profiles. Jobs can also now be suspended. And what this means is that if you say a higher priority job is to be scheduled, the lower priority job can be suspended until the higher priority job is completed. It doesn't have to be rescheduled. Work can pick back up when the higher priority job is done. Something you know we've seen in a lot of classic batch systems for years. Lastly, there's been some changes to the Kubernetes API server so it can be tuned to support the exceedingly high throughput of requests that often come in with batch job oriented systems. And all these things combined will make running AI, ML and batch workloads significantly easier on top of Kubernetes.
And at this point, with that sort of you know short preview of the improvements to things like multi-cluster and AI ML and batch, you may have started to pick up on a theme. What is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is foundational. We spent four years building a strong base. All the core workloads and design patterns that you depend on today started here. It is extensible. A year and a half were spent making it easy for people to adopt, build, and extend on that foundation, creating an ecosystem that is just absolutely massive today. Kubernetes is mature. We put a lot of effort into making sure you can depend on every feature and every release. And we demonstrated this by extending our support window. So what is Kubernetes now? Is it easy? Well, we're not there yet. We're making it easier for you to use. We're reducing much of the complexity that has forced people into workarounds and building our out large, more complex systems. A lot of these features and improvements may seem minor at first look, but all of them are there to help improve the various workflows that people have built around and on top of Kubernetes. And as we make Kubernetes easier for people to use, it will also enable a whole new set of use cases that we haven't imagined yet. So Kubernetes isn't easy yet, but we'll get there. And that, if you are interested in learning more about some of the stuff I talked about today, here are some additional resources that you might find useful. In particular, I want to highlight the Learn Kubernetes with Google video series. You'll find videos going over how you can get going with multi-cluster index jobs and quite a bit more. Thank you, and I look forward to building the future of Kubernetes with you.